All right, in this video, I want to talk about the prospects of a potential civil war in the United States. And it's a somewhat clickbaity title in the sense that I don't think it's particularly likely that we are going to have an actual war. Um, if we look at history, if we look at the previous civil war, there's many huge differences between you know the 1850s and today. Uh, we don't have decades and decades of belligerent antagonism. I don't think that we have the temperament as a society anymore to launch the type of war that happened in the 1860s or even in the 1940s, um, where you have a huge percentage of the population being willing to volunteer. And in the Civil War, we are talking mostly about volunteers. There was some conscri conscription, but not a lot, not a great deal, who were, you know, disagreed so vehemently whether they were Southerners with the North or Northerners with the South, they were willing to go to arms, go through all kinds of privations, privations that nobody today ever faces, essentially, uh, and do so for years and years on end. I don't know that there's that that level of martial spirit still exists in the society, and so I, I'm not saying that a war of that type, as if technology today would even allow for a war of that type to happen. Um, but it's becoming increasingly obvious that there are large segments of American society that are becoming increasingly incapable of having any kind of cooperative civil engagement. Now, I don't want to exaggerate how far this has gone. Obviously, people are still getting along fairly well. I can still get in my car and travel anywhere in the country. Things are not, you know, overtly belligerent, but it is becoming increasingly difficult to have any kind of civil agreement on big issues. Now, culture is a really fascinating thing, and I think that any discussion of it tends to oversimplify things. So if I was to say, well, we have the two groups in the United States, the liberal elites, the, the East Coast progressives, the urban Democrats, and then the you know, or as uh, my friend Ivan the Heathen would say, the um, the Brahmins or the elect or the the clerisy, as Dieter McCloskey would call them, and their followers. And then you have the townies, uh, the Middle Americans, the uh, you know the the flyover country people. You know, I could explicitly you know, label those two groups, and that would be very, very broad and very, very imprecise. I think a good way to look at human society is to see it as rather analogous to the human body in the sense, or the human species, in the sense that a, a human, the human body and the human species is, is defined by a, a huge cluster of individual genes, and these genes are not unique to, hum, to humans, right? So we have genes that we share with all kinds of other, not only animals, but other life forms. And what makes hum humans unique is just the combination of the genes and how they're activated, right? It's not like there is a specific human gene. There's genes for, you know, uh, mammary glands and for teeth and for having vertebrae and for having eyes. Um, and I'm, I'm not simplifying, there isn't just a gene for having eye, but, you know, a cluster of genes that create that. And those same, same genes are present in other life forms, they may sometimes not even be entirely present in a human. And we just draw a line and say, and it's not an arbitrary line necessarily, but we draw a line and say, well, this combination of genes we're going to call homo sapiens, and this combination we're going to call chimpanzees or bonobos, or maybe even uh, a bondo ape, you know, another subspecies that I've, I've heard a little bit about. Um, and a society is very similar in that. There's a whole list. There's probably innumerable, I don't think, like I don't want to say inf infinite number, but you could never probably come up with a comprehensive list of the different um, cultural uh, memes and 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 mimetic uh, traits that make up a society. And to just label one as it, it, it's somewhat arbitrary, right? So we could take for English, uh, for for instance, English language, right? English is very common in the United States, but not everyone in the United States speaks it. And not everyone speaks the same type of English. And you have people who have different accents. So uh, there's people who live not far from Canada who have a lot of linguistic traits that are similar to Canada. And a lot of Canadians who have traits that are s linguistically similar to Americans and vice versa. Or uh, replying back to my previous video, we could look at something like circumcision. 
it's not like everyone in the United States is circumcised. You have people who are and people who aren't. And some, some of the people aren't aren't because they're Latino, and that's uncommon in Latino. Some of them have religious reasons. I've talked to people who say they're Baptists, and that's why. I've talked to people who say they're Catholic, and that's why they're not circumcised. I've had talked to people who said they are circumcised because of their religion. Uh, there are parts of Maine that, under Canadian influence, are typically uncircumcised. So, like, the cluster... We look at the United States and we, we say, oh, the United States culture, the United States society, but we're, we're bundling a huge number of cultural genes, cultural traits. And it's somewhat arbitrary to just say, well, these are, you know, this is America, right? Because English is not unique to American. Uh, circumcision is not unique to America. Uh, Protestantism is not unique to America. Atheism is not unique to America. Um, Natural law is not unique to America. Uh, multiculturalism, or you know, history, or whatever, whatever we want to put, and it's not just America. I'm not single. as, oh, America is this country that's just not unique. Uh, every country shares traits. There are no isolated societies, even ones that appear to be isolated or that are physically rather isol isolated. At some point, had contact with other societies, and they have traits in them that they, you know, at the very least, vestigial ones from that period. Right. Um, so the the distinction between the, the various nation states and their cultures is, is to a large extent an arbitrary one. Not not entirely. You could say, you know, there are certain I think I think it's easier with smaller states, but I think it's helpful to look at these these different cultural things. But if you look in the United States, it is not difficult to see these two very broad groupings again with all kinds of variation between them and the the townie uh brahmin or clerisy flyover country or however you want to put it the trumpers versus the not trumpers th this is a very big division and it's becoming very difficult for us to talk and to have any kind of civil engagement and i'm making this right after the shooting uh, the baseball shooting where uh, apparently a Bernie supporter went and started shooting Republicans and it seems to have been politically motivated. Uh, it happened yesterday. I haven't followed it too closely, so we don't know all the details. Um, so that might be emblematic of what I'm talking about, but it's certainly, even if it's not, my, you know, my, my intuition is still the case. I mean, this is actually being prompted by a conversation I was having today on Grindr. Uh, a guy hit me up. We started talking. He asked what I did for work. I told him that I was an oil field geologist. And then his immediate question was, how can you live with yourself? Are you morally okay with that? And I said, yeah, I am. Are you morally okay with using energy and using products made by oil and by purchasing, you know, using a huge amount of energy every day, which even if you're the most uh, mass transit friendly uh, vegan in a metro center, you are using a huge amount of energy every day. Uh, and energy being fungible means a lot of that is being a lot of that cost is being uh, uh, supported by hydrocarbons. And I'm not here to defend that. I'm just a statement of fact. You know, I don't see how the producers are the only ones guilty here if this is something that's actually morally lamentable. But this guy's attitude is very interesting, and it's not unique. It's just emblematic here. Uh, it's, I said, look, he didn't want to argue. He didn't. He just wanted to say, you are morally wrong. You're terrible. You don't know anything. I said, well, you know, I've worked in the industry 10 years. It maybe is there, I, I highly doubt there's anything you're going to tell me about it that I don't already know. This guy was 22, so he's quite a bit younger than me. Um, I'm assuming has no, um, no uh, actual uh, experience in the industry and only knows what he's heard on occasional NPR articles. I don't know that, but inferring from what he did say, that does seem to be the case. And before the conversation went more than 10 minutes, he just blocked me. He just, I don't want to talk to you. And we're getting this. We're getting this siloing of, of uh, and echo chambers developing for everyone. And it's becoming reinforcing. People of, you know, the internet is helping this. Facebook is helping this. Uh, we're able to self-segregate. Um, and the result is that we are diverging. And that divergence has fundamental disagreements about the nature of government, the nature of the United States, the role of the United States, how we should be organized, how we should function, and how we should work. And it's going to lead to massive, massive problems. Now, I think there are obvious libertarian solutions to this. I think this is a good time. I mean, the small, I, when people have disparate ideas, 
allowing them to organize voluntarily and to do things to, to self-segregate as much as they want and just make sure their interactions are mutually beneficial, that's, I think, a, a palliative to this, right? I don't care if you want to, I don't care if you uh, are a socialist and you want to live on a commune or you want to eat vegan friendly food or you want to have a phone that's fair trade or you don't want to use fossil fuels. Those are all fine. I don't mind people doing that. They're perfectly welcome to do that and they're perfectly welcome to organize to do that. And that's great, but this is very difficult when we when it's a political question. As soon as we say, well, we're going to have political solutions to this, then all of a sudden we can't agree to disagree. There's going to be winners and losers, and then we're going to have to have a fight, at very least a political fight, uh, over who's going to get what. You're going to have majorities, you're going to have minorities, you're going to have special interests that are gaming the system. I think, you know, obviously I'm an anarchist, I think that would be... A, a very persuasive and, and good way to help alleviate this problem and solve all problems, but I think it would be a good way. You could also say that, well, the more min, the most minimal state possible would also possibly address this. So like if we weren't legislating things like energy policy or education policy uh, or religious policies or things like that, then those would not be issues that would, we would be fighting about in the political sphere and we could agree to disagree, right? I think education is a good example of this. People get in all these fights about whether we should do evolution or not evolution. Should we teach the Armenian genocide? Should we teach about, you know, Africa? Should we teach about what foreign languages should we speak? Should there be phys ed? Should we teach about health care? Should we talk, talk, teach about sex? Blah, 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 blah. You know, and I think the obvious answer is there isn't a single pedagogy that's best for everyone. I don't, I don't think that that's a defensible position, that different people can have different values and different educational goals, and it makes sense for them to, you know, argue that accordingly to to organize accordingly say oh our, our kids want to be you know tradesmen and they want to do that that's fine oh our kids want to have a, a literary education okay that's fine approach that way the minute you say it's got to be public then you cannot have that kind of decentralized tailored to whatever individuals want you have to have this debate about you know should should we have pe and should the blah 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 and it becomes a battle a non and 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 of course in that case it becomes a proxy battle in the culture war and especially when we're talking about evolution or creationism by the way i'm 100 percent not a creationist i don't believe in it but i also don't necessarily think that evolution has a place in education right i 100 percent believe in evolution i think it's fascinating i think it's very insightful but that doesn't mean it automatically has a place in education whether you agree or disagree it, it wouldn't be better if we just didn't have that as something we thought about why are we going to tap i mean you can't go to evangelicals and tell them Listen, you have to. You're going to be taxed to pay for public schools. You're obligated. Your com, your kids are compulsorily forced to go or to go to some approved alternative, um, and then tell them. But you don't have any say in the curriculum. The curriculum is going to be what I say it is. You just have to help subsidize it and pay for it. That's completely ridiculous. That's completely unfair. You know whether or not you think that what they want to teach is wrong or not. That expectation is ridiculously unreasonable, and that is not simply the case. That's only an illustrative case. It comes down to everything else, whether it is defense, right? Oh, you don't want to own a gun? Fine, don't own a gun. Don't own a gun, you know? Or you only want guns that have special locks on them or whatever. Fine, do that. Don't force that on other people. All right, so the problem is we don't have enough people you know, I think that that solution would be would be an effective palliative. But I also have to recognize that the vast majority of people, and this is in both camps, not just the liberal one, are not in that mindset. But we have very divergent ideas about American nationalism. And here's another thing. I think that nationalism, not just in the United States, is almost always a chimera. You have a state, it's ruling over people, but these people are never homogenous, or very rarely, unless you're talking about a very small state like Iceland or maybe maybe something like North Korea or Mongolia or a place with a very small, maybe ethnically homogenous, culturally homogenous society. And there aren't any that are purely so. I mean, if you can point to a place where every citizen or every person is a clone in every conceivable ideological, physical sense, please point it out to me. But, uh, you know, maybe the Vatican City, but geez, I mean, we're, we're talking about at best microstates. Even a place like Iceland doesn't fit. There's plenty of people in Iceland who are not Icelandic, who are atheists or religious and blah, blah, blah. And that's a very, very small state. That's something like, what, 200, 300,000 people maybe. Um, 
you have a state and it's ruling over these disparate groups. And as we know, states cannot rule by force alone. There has to be some kind of ideological um, support. They have to have some kind of sanction. Maybe it's religious, maybe it's civic, uh, maybe it's democratic, whatever it is. But when the populations don't agree on the nature of that, you're going to have all kinds of problems. Now, the system can still function, okay? I'm not saying this to say, therefore, states are disproven and they can't exist. Obviously, they can exist. You have states despite this, but this causes ever-increasing problems. And this is a, probably eventually what leads to the collapse of most states that aren't destroyed externally from whatever force, right? You have the society develops. You have, when you have designed political systems, often, you know, they're designed with, a, with an intention to balance this or that um, diff, diff, disparate group. So in ancient Rome, you're, you're trying to balance the power of the plebeians with the um, with the proletariats, with the proles, right? You know, so there's a, a, a checks and balance system that's supposed to acknowledge the, the, the privileges and the rights of both groups, and it's a power sharing arrangement, and it works for a while, but then it's not as adaptable. The state state institutions have their own inertia to them and their own in, their own incentives to grow, which don't necessarily line up with what's happening in society generally. Although they're obviously interrelated, and you get in the case with Rome, you get certain of the of the um, patrician class becoming astronomically wealthy through uh, socialized costs with privatized rewards. Right, they conquer an area. And then a couple rich people, a couple powerful people in the state would inherit essentially all the wealth from those places, right? So Caesar became extremely wealthy through the conquest of Gaul, but he did not conquer Gaul, you know, with his own private money. He, he, it was with an army that was furnished by a state, by the, pro, by the Poles. And these mega rich, the, the disparity of wealth in this case, upended the system and the Roman Republic fell and became the Roman Empire. In the United States, we already had this happen once. All right, we have this very delicate attempt to balance on the issue of slavery, make sure that there's a balance between the slave states and the free states. And this became increasingly difficult because society wasn't developing in, a, in an equal way. The free states were becoming much more prosperous. They were becoming much richer and much more populous. They were spreading much more naturally. And there were many attempts, all the compromises, you hear about the Compromise of 1850, the Great Compromise of 1833, the Kansas Nebraska Act, all this stuff, the Missouri Compromise, all these were attempts to bolster slavery so that it would, by, by cognizant, conscientious Northerners and Southerners say, hey, we realize that if there's a minority and majority sectarian grouping in the country, that it's going to be a house divided, to steal a later phrase. And it's not going to work. And so let's try and engineer, you know, carefully engineer something that's very balanced. And they tried for a long time. And the greatest like politicians the United States have ever had, people like Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, uh, they spent their careers fostering that. And it failed, and we had a huge civil war. Now, the civil war, you know, settled the question of slavery. It limit it eliminated slavery as an issue, but there are innumerable other issues. And they're not all immediately that pressing, but as things develop, it is extremely unlikely that the political process and that the state are going to adapt either at all, or if they do adapt, that they'll adapt fast enough or in a way that's enough to ideally counterbalance what's happening in society at large, right? And so we have now these two groups, right, again, that is a very imprecise way to look at it. There is some overlap, but it's becoming increasingly, increasingly difficult. We're getting a much more radicalized left, right? The moderate Democrats are gone. One, one fact that many of you may be aware of is that during the course of the Obama administration, Democrats lost almost a thousand seats in state houses across the country. Republicans control the country in a way that they haven't since just before the Great Depression. Um, and the moderate Democrats, the blue dog Democrats, the pro-gun, pro-life, you know, but big government guys, those people have been eliminated and been replaced by moderate Republicans and Tea Party Republicans in some cases, or even Libertarian Republicans in a few cases. Uh, you know, like Justin Amash, a, ra a fairly radical Ron Paul Libertarian Republican has replaced a moderate Republican, you know, a run-of-the-mill Republican in, in Michigan. And that's happened, right? They're not, and the 
the remaining Democrats are the Nancy Pelosi's, right, and the Bernie Sanders's, and the the Black Lives Now and the Antifa people. They and their their zeitgeist is such that those who aren't actually that radical don't have any kind of way to handle or control the more radical elements. They don't have a way to talk down to them. They've accepted too many, too much of the political correctness, too many of the tropes, too much of the worldview to rebuke people for saying crazy things like, uh, you know, you're evil if you do oil, you're evil if you are a man, you're evil if you're a white gay man, you're evil if you don't adopt all these uh, pronouns, you're evil if you don't give me free health care, you're evil, blah, 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 blah. You're evil for everything, all right? And they're constantly, constantly, condescendingly spitting on, berating, and uh, castigating everybody else. And even when this is pointed out, even when we're like you, you are angering hundreds, at least at least a hundred, tens of millions of people, right? It's in terms of majority, in terms of absolute numbers, we are talking about like almost a split down the middle, right? If you look at the elections, they're very close, and considering the fact that not everyone's voting, those aren't perfect, but it's very very close. Um, if we're talking about geography, the the I guess you could say the right wing, the Republican, the Trump, the, the flyover people are, are the larger group. Um, the urban elites are restricted to a few urban centers, right? And I, I've, I've read this also that it's, it's, it's interesting that the cities have started to resemble the other cities more than the countryside surrounding them, right? So somebody in Denver is more likely to be akin to somebody in New York than they are to say somebody in Fort Collins or or Granby or some other city in Colorado that's actually relatively close to Denver. Fort Collins is very close to Denver. Can't say that I know that based on talking to people from Fort Collins, but it's just coming to mind. So it's it's just there's less and less common ground. There's nothing we can talk about, and it's like what is the uniting national interest here? What is the zeitgeist? You know. Like in, in a place like Switzerland, they have this medieval, we all got together and to form this, you know, cooperative uh, defense, you know, thing. Okay, and it's not perfect, you know, but that's their thing. What, is, what do we have in the United States? It seems like on the, on the principal potential areas of agreement, there's actually diametrical disagreement. So I, I like to say in the American civil religion, we kind of have two. We have the Founding Fathers, Constitution, Bill of Rights broadly the minarchist libertarian kind of ideal right and that is basically the townies right these are people who will say they support the constitution and they believe in the constitution they may not know that much about it or be that sophisticated about it and they may not even have views that are really even that close to say what hamilton or jefferson would have had but they have deference and reference to that and they probably accept a lot of the bill of rights right and they mostly just want to be left alone. I mean, they're not perfect. I'm not saying that they're totally laissez-faire libertarian, that they uh, are without flaw, and it's certainly not the case. Um, they have their own bigotries and their own their own problems, but you then you have the, the clerisy, the uh, urban elite, the Brahmins. They look at the Constitution as inherently racist, inherently flawed, that the ideas in it are terrible, that they're outdated, that they're uh, quaint, that they're um, regressive. Uh, they can't even get over the identity of this right, who they just view as totally irredeemable. Um, and well, we can't we can't then get along on that basis, right? We don't agree on that. Now, if we're talking about the new civic religion, which is big government, and then the government is what makes society progressive and the growth of the state power is, is the growth of progress within society generally and that we need the state to do things and that there are certain tasks that you have to have the state do and that there's all these programs that we need the government to do, right? And this is sincerely, axiomatically accepted without question by this other group, all right? They don't have a government program they don't like. Very few of them have a balanced view of like, well, I want a market economy, but there are certain programs that I think the government ought to do because there's market failure and whatever. Um, they tend to want more government all the time. There's not a program that they don't disagree with. But the other segment thinks that that's socialism, that that's un-American, that that's unconstitutional, that it's evil, that it's wrong, that it's sacrilegious, blah, blah, blah. 
where's the common ground here? And I think there are some strands that are fairly common, but it's not a lot to grasp on. So we could look at, say, the military, right? If we look at especially World War II, you know what? The townies love World War II. They love to wave their flags and they love patriotism and they love to take vicarious pleasure in the achievements of others. And they love to, yeah, 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 we kick the bad guy's ass. And the liberals, they love World War II too. Like, oh yeah, the army of democracy, we're the arsenal of democracy. We're going to go out and make, you know, go to war in Afghanistan to help women. And we're going to do this and we're going to use use violence and bombs to spread, make our, our city on the hill, you know, and, and our atheist yet millennialist, you know, uh, preparation for the apocalypse, right? But they don't... <laughs> That's not a lot to go on, right? That's that's not a, a really strong basis for a state. Although it's not uncommon, like historically having a state that is more or less where the army is the linchpin that kind of holds it all together. Not, not And I don't mean that in the sense of holds it together by brute force, but holds it, of course that happens as well, or tries to temporarily anyway, but holds it together and that's what people have in common. You know, I think, I think a lot of times this might have been true of say uh, uh, Germany once it was united under Prussia. You know, you may have been Bavarian or you may have been Westphalian or from Hanover or from Baden or Hamburg, um, but you, you were in the Wehrmacht, you, you, you know, were, were soldiers from other parts of Germany, and yes, you retained a lot of sectional identity, but like that was like a unifying thing. And we kind of have that, but even here it's problematic because A, the, the townie, the, the Brahmins don't join the army. The Brahmins are they want to use it to implement their policy but they don't want to actually be members of it right so the military i think most of the members are going to be overwhelmingly townies they're going to be the constitutionalists the people who are motivated by that not by the people who believe in socialism ironic as that is because the army is in fact a socialist institution as far as i'm you know as far as i'm concerned uh so you know that's a thread there may be some others but they're very very few and far between the constitution like i said isn't one because there's vast disagreement about that from reverence and sacred to contemptible and irrelevant right those are not mutually uh you know th those those views are not inclusive with each other they're antagonistic towards each other uh you know history i mean the history we have divergent views on it you know so some of us are gonna like when the Brahmins and the townies look back at history, they reach totally different conclusions, whether we're talking about the American Revolution or the colonial period. Uh, again, maybe they favor World War II, but it's going to be for different reasons, right? You know, a lot of them are, uh, they're going to, the, Kane, the Keynesians are going to look at World War II like, look, see, this just proves the government is good and it's how beneficial it is. And the townies aren't going to see it that way. They're going to see it as, look, you know, sometimes you have to be, defend yourself. You know, and so that's what we're doing. We're defending ourselves, which I think was erroneous, even in the case of World War II to a large extent. But side topic. So I don't I don't know what that we can build it on. And I'm not lamenting that in the sense that I think secession is fine. I don't I'm I'm an anarchist. I don't think that we should have an American state, but like what is it based on? I mean, yeah, there's the monuments, there's a certain like uh, reverence for the authority of 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 that, but even that's being you know, eroded considerably. You know, that, that reference is obviously diminished if you can go and shoot up a whole bunch of congressmen, apparently, or berate them, even if that didn't happen, right? Just the fact that you would berate them or that you would think so lowly of them, you know, that uh, you, you won't listen to them, that you hate them. And this is, again, both sides to each other. You know, and I guess one thing is that the political class, these differences are muted, right? So I don't think that your average Republican in Congress is a typical Brahmin, is a typical townie, right? I actually think that the people, at, especially at the federal level, and this is not all of them, but overwhelmingly, are essentially urban elites, all right? Uh, if they are originally not from the urban centers, they've been living in D.C., they've been working in the D.C. crowd long enough, they've probably internalized a lot of that. Um, you know, and if this is something, if you analyze, you know, their conservatism, whatever that means is usually not heartfelt and not particularly strong because they're in a socialist institution, because they're in a government, the tendency and the, and the, uh, incentive is for them to kind of adhere to bigger and bigger government. Right. And so that might be one of the big things that's kind of holding it all together that the political elites on both sides 
are more left, all right? They're, they're, they're in the Brahmin class, I mean, almost by definition. I don't think all of them share that exactly. You do have the Justin Amashes and the Ron Pauls and maybe the Ram Pauls, debatably, depending on the day. Um, Justin Massey's a few others. Now, at the state level, this is probably less true. I think at the state level, you're going to have a lot more. I was just watching some videos from a, a state rep in Wyoming, and the shit was really good, man. I mean, he was clearly, uh, well, not clearly, because a politician is able to sound clearly principled and not necessarily be so, but, uh, you know, much more much more right wing, actual non rhino, um, get out of my life, don't don't uh don't tell me what to do. Uh, and also live and love live, you know. Uh he, the the guy I'm thinking of was making a video addressing the city council of Jackson, which is very liberal, and saying, Hey, you guys are free to do whatever you want. Just don't force it out on everyone else's throats. And here's the other thing. That that live and let live attitude is not is completely anathema to the Brahmins. They are they are the Saurons of today. They want to control everything. They look at the world as something that they should shape, that can be perfected, and that they happen to know how, right? I think the world can be optimized. I think that there's no such thing as utopia, but we can have the best under the circumstances. But that requires, for both moral, moral and utilitarian reasons, as much personal autonomy and freedom as possible, all the way to the point of anarchism, if you ask me, but at the very least, to minarchism. And that is just completely beyond the pale to these guys who want to look at it and be like, no, I want to shape society to be this way and that way. Not just not just in the sense of big programs like Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid or universal health care or national defense, but to what do you call people? How do you think? You know, how when you what, what like your your internal mental processes, these are things that they they seek to rule as much as they can. They have a will to power that they fucking can't control. So I don't know, and and the thing is, there's going to be pushback, you know. And I, I just, you know, Alex Jones is very entertaining and full of shit half the time, or if not more, more than that. It's not always wrong either. But like, this is it is so strange to me when I see all of these anti-gun liberal subway drivers who can't even change a tire or drive a car, who've never been in the military, who've never touched a gun, and are afraid of them, like literally terrified of them. Uh, who are belligerently antagonizing tens of millions of people, belittling them day in, day out on their Facebook posts uh, and their public speech. Uh, and sure, you have free speech, you have every right to belittle people. And like, I'm not, look, townies have lots of things you can say about them. They're not necessarily that sophisticated. They're not necessarily that well-read. Even when they're capitalist and free market, they don't. You typically understand that stuff very well. There obviously are exceptions, right? There's the folksy wisdom that is sometimes actually pretty good, and there's also the folksy wisdom that's kind of pretty shitty, right? But why the fuck would you antagonize people to the point where you cannot cooperate with them any any further when they have all the guns and they're the ones who are in the army and they're the ones who have all the food, right? I mean, this is. <laughs> This is another reason why there there won't I don't think we could anticipate a war like the Civil War right because who the, what is New York going to conquer Iowa and Nebraska fuck no the subway doesn't go that far like the T in Boston does not go past Medford right so there's no way that they're going to march up to fucking New Hampshire and uh, you know subdue even a hundred gun owners I mean that's hyperbole but like I just don't see and I'm not saying that they want to do that necessarily but if if you are if you want to politically dominate people, which is what they want, right? When they talk about abolishing the, the the electoral college, what they are saying is we want to have political domination of you. And that's another, you know, the founding fathers were per not perfect, of course, but like they understood that pure democracy leads to majoritarian tyranny. And you're going to have, that's more, just morally wrong in and of itself, but on utilitarian grounds, you're going to have irreconcilable conflict then. You're going to have sectarian physical coercive disputes then when that breaks down. And so they, and, and the big issue for them was slavery. And so they tried very, very hard to have this system of checks and balances and power balancing. And that's the whole point of the electoral college is to make sure that the majority population states can't just rule everything, right? There's something to be said for the idea that despite its population, California should not have dictatorial powers over Montana, Idaho, 
Wyoming, North and South Dakota, you know, Nebraska, Iowa. It just doesn't. They don't know shit about those countries. Just like the guy who blocked me today doesn't know shit about the oil industry, right? And to just blithely go, we should abolish the Electoral College and just have it be majoritarianism, you are asking for it to degenerate into violence or at least an inability to cooperate at all. And that's where we're headed, right? I don't see how we're going to become more cooperative unless it's along the venues, you know, that I say, which is, and that sounds extremely arrogant, I know, but like, I'll, I'll agree to disagree, to live and let live, to don't think that they can let go of that, you know, and, and to put one in for the townies here, I don't know if they can like, I mean, to them, the idea of the United States might be sacred, right? It, it has a religious connotation for a lot of people, which is totally, of course, doctrinally ridiculous but they still have may feel that way and you know if california decides to leave which i fully support none of the democrats in the rest of the country will ever allow that because then their power is gone forever at least for many generations to come um you know the townies i mean i could the townies in the army i would see very more than willing to you know check that with force if necessary if they if they deemed it necessary so, so but I just don't see how this is going to change, right? People aren't going to listen. People, uh, you know, if you read Jonathan Haidt, right, he says you don't debate people into persuading them. There's only a very small percentage of the population that is uh, swayable to sheerly logical and persuasive arguments, right? It's about becoming friends first and then uh, then swaying them because they accept you as somebody that they can trust. But we can't even do that anymore. Like, I'm not, I don't go, when I interact with people, I have long passed the stage where I preach about my political philosophy for people. I do it on this channel, you know, this is a separate form, but in my personal life, I don't go to people and say, I'm a libertarian, here's why, blah, 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 blah. Here's what I think about Trump, here's why, here's what I think about Clinton. Now, if people ask me, I'm not going to lie, I try and sugarcoat it as much as I possibly can without being, you know, intellectually dishonest, but... You can't even be friends with these people, right? As soon as they find one thing where you are verboten, right? One idea, one uh, uh, one issue, one thing, before they even know anything else about you, they want to disassociate. Or if they don't immediately disassociate like this guy did today, or and this happened before, right? They will just block you out. They will just say, you're an evil Republican, you're a Trump supporter, you're a conservative, you're a Christian, whatever it is, right? And and it goes both ways, I think. I think that the haughty, condescending, fucktard, liberal, Harvard people, fuck. I mean, nothing has disabused me of the um, superiority of the elites than, you know, coming to the Northeast and actually meeting people at Harvard and realizing, like, these, these fuckers... Yes, yeah, they are smart people who go there in general, although there's a lot of legacy bullshit that happens there. It is very much a New England, uh, you know, old money elite club in that sense. But there are some smart people there, but they are nowhere near the level that they would need to be, as if anyone even could be, to fucking run society or to have that kind of status, right? But in their minds, they do, all right? In their minds, and I'm not just talking Harvard people here, the fact that they go to the Met, the fact that they listen to opera the fact that they voted for bernie or that they're that they'll they'll a cocktail atheist and that they don't believe in god and so they're so fucking smart because they don't think the bible's literal because that's fucking genius and no one ever thought of that before like the, and and look just the way i even talk about them you know and i i'm open i i have i i keep liberal friends i have i still have some I'm not, I've never unfriended someone or blocked someone. I will talk to anyone. Uh, I don't wear my politics on my sleeve, but how, how, what are we supposed to do? They won't, they won't even listen. They don't want to listen. And when they talk to the townies, and I'll say this, you know, the townies don't always get what the fuck are you talking about? You no, know, I, I don't agree with Sam Harris on a lot of things, but like, you know, right after the Trump, he was like, look, when you start going to people and telling them, well, you can't wear that ho Halloween costume because it's insensitive and you're racist and blah, 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 blah. It's like, what are you talking about? Intersection, I mean, The Onion did a hilarious article where they have like this kind of Midwestern old dude wearing a Carhartt talking about feminism and how he didn't know about all that. And it's just hilarious because the terminology is ridiculous. You know, all this, uh, you know, postmodern Marxist bullshit that doesn't make any sense, you know, that 
it doesn't stand up to any logical scrutiny but even if you but that's even assuming like you understand the special meaning and all the terms and everything right i mean marx in particular he Engels told him that his books were going to be misconstrued because they were so unbelievably uh, unclear and verbose and used language in such an uh, obscurantist way that he said people are going to blank, accuse you of being obscurantist. And they are because it is fucking obscurantist. Now, I don't know if Marx wanted it that way or that's just he thought he was being cool or I, apparently that was something that a lot of Hegelian German fully wrote in that style. Fair enough. But it's totally unintelligible even to intelligent people, right? It's almost meant to be. So do I think that we're going to have, you know, a declaration of war and, you know, armies mustering? No, I, I think that's rather unlikely. But are we going to start having more and more disassociation in some form or another? I think that's almost inevitable. And that's to be welcomed, right? Like, if we could all, like, get along, that would be great, but we can't. I mean, we're not going to fight each other, and I don't think, and I hope that I hope that's not what happens. Um, and again, I'm not saying this is necessarily going to happen anytime soon, but like there could be. I mean, if something if, if something outlandish happens with Trump or after Trump, uh, you know, and I'm again not a Trump supporter, but like when you have people who support him who think he's a great president, and then you have other people who want to see him dead. And that's not that's not new, all right. People, there were people who thought FDR should die. I remember a friend of mine. I was talking to his grandfather, and I was talking about FDR, and he said he had friends back in the '30s who he went to their house for dinner once, and there was a picture of uh, FDR, but it was uh, near the floor in a dark corner, you know, where there was no light. And he said, "Why is your picture of FDR, you know, like in the shadow like that?" And like, because he belongs in the shadows, because he's a dark character, right? So. You know these presidents get eulogized in, after their deaths, uh, especially if they die in office, and especially if they're assassinated, like someone like Lincoln. But the truth is, they are almost never seen as the um, you know uh, messianic figures that they are sometimes uh, remembered as. Um, so you know the stuff with the Kathy Gifford and stuff. I don't, I don't find that that important, except to the extent that where you have one side going, that's fine and that's good, and that's their entire. You know, their impulse is to act that way, and then the other side, like that's beyond the pale, and that's what we're getting. So, I don't know. Let me know what you think. Uh, like, obviously, we're in a very dis different situation than we were in the 1850s or 1860s for a whole slew of other reasons. But there are there's clearly segment large scale segmentation of the country, and the ability of the of those sides, and there are other subdivisions of that. To reconcile with each other is diminishing rapidly and i don't see what's going to reverse that right i mean i can imagine some things but they would all be bad right so anyway let me know what you think and i will all talk to you later that doesn't make sense but sorry